Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church here in Burlington, North Carolina on the second Sunday in Lent. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, our leader and guide, in the waters of baptism, you bring us to new birth to live as your children. Strengthen our faith in your promises that by your Spirit we may lift up your life to all the world through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in all you the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The appointed psalm is Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, who will not let your foot be moved, and he who watches over you will not fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, so that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. The second lesson is from Romans. What are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It is, if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. 
What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe them, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except for the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Scrolling through Facebook one day, I saw a post from Chad Bird, one of the theologians I follow on social media, and he had a brief post with just a couple of scripture quotes from Paul's letters discussing the struggle with sin that leads to death and Christ's victory that rescues us from death. And only a few comments down from his post, someone had added, Yes, but we must strive moment to moment to be Jesus in all we do or say. We must not act however we want, knowing we'll be forgiven. Jesus is our Savior and must be our Lord as well. Of course, what this person had added to the post is not untrue. We should strive to be Jesus in our actions. We should act like Jesus really is our Lord, and our lives should look different from this world because Jesus is our Lord. And so Chad affirmed this commenter on his post by agreeing that such is indeed good and true. However, he took issue with the comment as it began with the words, yes, but, yes, but. He mentioned that it never fails when he simply attempts to speak the gospel that many will quickly chime in with a yes, but statement. And it always seeks to add what we must do in order to make the gospel true for us. So Chad Bird then posed this question. He asked, why not let the good news of Jesus just be good news? Why not let Jesus simply say, I love you? Why is there always this need, this tug to add a footnote or a yes but kind of warning? And his suggestion, and I tend to agree with him, is that it comes from our tendency to be law-oriented creatures. I mean, we know how to operate in that way. We tend to function from the position of what we must do or what we shall not do, or from the position of what we feel we have to be or what we should not be. And so, when we hear the gospel proclaimed, a word that may in fact seem too good to be true about the free gift of God's grace, we chime in to add our footnotes, our warnings about what we need to do. Perhaps it helps us feel 
not so undeserving. Uh, perhaps it helps us not feel like we are such a case for God's charity if we can somehow show our understanding of what we should do. Now, while we certainly do have our appropriate response to the good news of our Lord Jesus, namely to be living as the body of Christ in the world, striving for the good order of God's law and loving and serving both God and our neighbor, by adding all of that to the gospel proclamation itself as a sort of footnote, we surely run the risk of beginning to believe that the gospel alone is not enough for us. And so that's why it's important to do what Chad Bird says. Let the gospel simply be what it is, the good news of Jesus Christ for your salvation. In today's appointed readings, we have such an opportunity to hear the gospel announced by the scripture readings. We get the clear proclamation, especially from Jesus and from Paul, that our salvation is the work of God, and we are invited to simply let that good news be the good news for us. In today's gospel lesson from St. John, we hear those famous words that we easily commit to memory and learn by heart, those words of Jesus beginning, For God so loved the world. But before we get there, we have what the context of that proclamation is. A Pharisee named Nicodemus has come to question Jesus. And he's an interesting character mentioned only in John's gospel account. And he's, he's a Pharisee, but he's more than a Pharisee. He's a leader of the Jews, meaning he's part of the Sanhedrin, the, the court of elders, the tribunal. In fact, the group that would later condemn Jesus. So to say that he is a law-oriented person or that he's someone who's very much at home in the law and of what one must do, that, that would be an understatement. But we see some hope among the Pharisees here, though, as Nicodemus truly seems to be intrigued by Jesus and genuinely wants to understand him. And during later, during the of Jesus' trial by the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus is the only Pharisee to speak up with any kind of defense for Jesus. And after the crucifixion, Nicodemus joins another Pharisee, Joseph of Arimathea, in laying Jesus' body in the tomb. But at this early point in John's Gospel, Nicodemus is at least ready to acknowledge that Jesus is a teacher from God. He says, no one can do the signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus' response to this is to say, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Now, what does Jesus' response have to do with what Nicodemus said. Well, I submit that there is some gospel announced here for Nicodemus's benefit. It seems to me that Jesus is kind of affirming what Nicodemus has said. If Nicodemus can recognize that Jesus is from God or that God is with him, uh, you know, then he is on his way to receiving the gospel, and he's on his way to being what Jesus says, born from above. But perhaps being a law-oriented person, Nicodemus can't simply let the gospel be the gospel. He's concerned with what thou shall or shalt not do. He presses on with questions about the plausibility of such a birth, of, of being born from above. And his question is, how can one enter the womb a second time and be born? And so his question reveals that his focus is earthly 
and inwardly. It's concerned with what is actually achievable by human beings. What is achievable by us according to the flesh? What law or work is this that is to be performed here? But the answer and the gospel, the, the good news, is what is in what Jesus has already said. To be born from above should be a freeing thing to hear because throughout Scripture, those words from above normally refer to where God is. So to be born from above is to be born of God or from God. And therefore, it is the work of God and not us that we should be so born. It's a point that Jesus surely seeks to drive home in the following discourse about being born of water and spirit rather than simply of the flesh. It's a reference, of course, to what we know as Christian baptism, uh, where we are born of the spirit and filled with the spirit, with the earthly element of water as a sign. We're not doing the work in that washing and baptism. God is doing that work in us so that the Spirit may enter in and take up residence in us. And so there we are born from above with God as our Father. And still, Nicodemus wants a footnote. How can these things be, he asks. Perhaps he still grasps for some work by which this is achieved, some law by which this can be understood, but Jesus will not give him one. In answer, he, Jesus instead focuses even further on the saving work that the Father was doing through him. Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And further, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The key to understanding all of this, of course, is in that phrase, everyone who believes in him. We see that this is not a matter of the law or of works. It's not a matter of what we must be doing in order to make this grace of God true and real for us. It's rather a matter of faith, faith in Christ Jesus and in the saving work accomplished for us when he is lifted up on the cross. And yet, we still might protest and say, aha, there it is, we must have faith. That's what we must do in order to have the gospel. But faith is a part of that gospel. For faith, too, is a gift of God planted in us when we are born from above by water and spirit and holy baptism. Faith in Christ saves for sure, not because we have worked to achieve that faith, but because God has provided for its growth in us. We could never achieve the gospel on our own by our own works of the law. We could never be righteous enough to earn our salvation. And yet, by faith in Christ, we are reckoned by God as righteous. Being born from above, we are clothed in Christ's righteousness. And this is why Paul teaches the Romans by example of Abraham, saying that Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness by God, not because he worked for it or earned it or had bragging rights, but simply because 
He was chosen by God. He was given promises by God. And Abraham believed God. He allowed the good news to be just that. And he had faith in the promise. Paul writes, For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace. What more freeing good news do we need than to know that working out our salvation is not a work that rests upon our shoulders, but it rests upon the grace of God. It rests upon his love and mercy and promise through faith in Christ our Lord. And if we truly are concerned about works, concerned about what we should be doing or not be doing in our day-to-day -day lives, then fret not, for faith is a living and active thing in us, and it will do those faithful works in and through us, both as individuals and together as the body of Christ in the world. But we need no further footnote to the gospel. We need no further note to say, yes, but you must this, that, or the other. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can let that good news simply be the good news for us. We can stand in the presence of our Lord and simply let him say to us, I love you and to let him show us that perfect love of God in his death and resurrection that saves us from sin and the grave. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.